Amen. Hallelujah. Hello, everybody. God bless you today. This is Susan Puzio, and I want to welcome you to the Prophetic News radio broadcast. And we're heard on Spreaker and iTunes and many other different platforms. If you're trying to find us, you can put in Prophetic News or Prophetic News Radio. And you should be able to find our program. Also, we want to remind you that we have our two books on Amazon, Paula White, President Trump's Pastor, and Seed Faith, Can a Man Bribe God? Also, we have two YouTube channels, one Greedy Preachers TV and Prophetic News TV under my name, Susan Puzio. Also, our website, propheticnews.com. So those things are available for you to enjoy, to listen to many, many years of programs. And then on our website, we have so many interesting articles that have been written over the years by many different people. So today we're going to talk about Kim Clement, Donald Trump, the New World Order, all the t- crazy happenings in the world. Can it get any crazier? Jackie Alnor is our guest today. Hi, Jackie. Greetings, Susan and listeners. Yes. So uh, what do you make of the condition of the universe? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I think it's imploding. No, you know, everything's right where it needs to be as far as the Bible prophecy goes and the, you know, that every jot and tittle of the prophecies in God's word is going to come true. And, you know, it's all in God's timing and it's all in his hands and he hasn't lost control. So we can relax, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Despite, Despite what we see happening around us, we can relax. <laughs> yeah, just rest assured it's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is so true. No, that that is very very true and we we it's shocking every day that I almost want to take like a sabbatical from the news so I don't have to hear it anymore. I do that from time to time, or else I'll watch the news through some somebody on the internet who does things funny. You know, like you, if anyone who follows me on Facebook, you know I like Mark Dice. I, I call his show The Daily Dice because he updates every day. And he always is top, talking about the topics that everybody's talking about, but he makes fun with it. And so you can look at it through the prism of comedy and it's a lot easier to take that way. (laughs) I guess it's a lot easier. Yeah. To take that way because it's almost too much to bear Mm -hmm. the, the horrible things. Oh, I know all this stuff with the uh, sisters of perpetual indulgence that are hitting the, um, you know, the June, whatever they call it, their Pride Month. And so they're going to be there at the ball games with not only the Dodgers, but also the, um, they call it the Los Angeles Angels. It used to just be the or- County Angels or whatever, but... That's my old turf right over there, but Crystal Cathedral's right around the corner, so there must be some weird principality or power over that place. <laughs> so so they say, so they say. Let's uh, start off here with some scripture from Galatians 1. The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Galatians, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me, Unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father 
and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. <laughs> He had a lot of wisdom, didn't he? Oh, what would we do without all of his epistles? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's when you hear the word of God, you got to just sit here and marvel at it, how it holds up. That it's yeah. as, as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago when those words were written. And, and the thing is, any other ancient book that you might pick up is not relevant. You know, they, it didn't hold up, but that is eternal. And it is, you know, the very, it is God breathed. And so it still has the same impact to us today as it did to those people reading the, or hearing it back then. So yeah, it, it, we serve an amazing God. <laughs> we really do. I like how he says he conferred not with flesh and blood. <laughs> mm. Oh. Yeah, well, that, that he didn't at first. He had to know where he was at and hear from the Lord before he could even speak to the other apostles. I mean, that was just the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gave him. And we need that same supernatural wisdom today more than ever as the second coming is, is so near. You know, how much more important is that for us? And, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I, I don't know about you, but I think that, you know, I get the, the word that comes more alive to me today than it has, you know, over the past couple of decades. It reminds me of when I was first saved. Remember when we were first saved and it's like everything in the Bible was, you know, like something new and everything. And, and, and uh, I see it, you know, actually coming alive on the pages because it is the living word. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing, and I, I like also how he said we people preach another gospel, and that's what is happening today, and it's so widespread. It's really scary, but it it just goes to show you, just like he said, I I I didn't confer with flesh and blood, so it's the same for us now. Is that we have to be responsible, each and every one of us for knowing God's word and not depending on someone else to tell us what the Bible says. Although we, there's a place for the fivefold ministry gifts in the body of Christ. But yet, 
we're responsible for knowing the word. We can't blame anybody else for bad teaching when we're supposed to be good Bereans and check it out. Yeah, you know, I post scriptures every day on my Facebook page that I just feel the Lord has given me. And there was one I shared the other day at a Romans that I think really people should pay attention to in our day and age more so than ever, because I think there's, you know, a lot of people argue over eternal security. And of course, you know, I think each of us has to have that eternal security for ourselves. But um, but I'm trying to find that passage that I shared because it was out of Romans. And boy, Romans 1 is certainly happening everywhere. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you can't get around it anymore. But this, the passage I, that I shared in Romans 11 says, Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Now, this is, I think, so pertinent in this time of the great apostasy, because the apostasy is going on. There's people who, you know, blithely, you know, say that they're Christians and and they just add Christ to everything they did before, <laughs> you know, yeah. that. Um, it's it's easy it's easy to say Lord Lord and not mean it in your heart and yeah so and I think that's where it comes from it's not that these people are saved and are losing their salvation it's just that there's so many people who got swept into the church with all the wrong motives or without sincerity as far as they're uh, they're laying their life down for for Jesus so. Yeah, well, the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. So there was the we we have we were talking the other day about that Rory Alec uh, that was yeah. married to Wendy Alec, and they started that God TV network. Yeah, and so I I went and listened to his latest broadcast. Now he's on YouTube, so he's totally unrepentant, and he said. Uh, Oh, well, I, I started this very large television network. And he was a scammer. He was always scamming people for money with the buy a miracle thing. Mm-hmm. And then he runs off on his wife and goes and lives with a woman. And he, he was unapologetic. He said, well, I got a divorce, but you can't judge me because you don't know me and I don't know you. Well, you're you're a public person. So, yeah, I know you by your fruit because I see what you're doing. I don't sit at home and imagine what you're doing. I see what you're doing. <laughs> so he says, oh, yeah, now I'm married to a woman that understands me. And, <laughs> oh, oh, so you, you divorce your wife and go and live with a woman and uh, because your wife doesn't understand you. It's, it, oh, well, I couldn't even then. believe it. I thought, what? This guy is so arrogant. He hasn't. He and then he's talk. Of course, he's talking about. Oh, I love the Lord, and yeah, you don't know the Lord. Yeah, well, Jesus said to so many, you know, your heart is far from me. You yeah, know? and and that's what we see so much of. And again, I don't try to separate the wheat from the chaff myself. You know, the angels are going to be doing that, in not too distant future. <laughs> but um, but as far as as fruit goes, some some people might look like good fruit on the outside, but only God knows the heart. I mean, I lived in Utah for three years. I met some of the nicest Mormons, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And they got the wrong Jesus yeah, and the wrong gospel, yeah. for heaven's sakes, you know. And so they can look quite good on the outside. And then I have known other people that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe in our perspective that might not look like they're very nice people, but we don't know if that is an improvement of, of what they were before, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's why, you know, man looks on the outside and God looks on the heart. And so, but, but we can see the trends and those kinds of things in, in what purports to be the church. And right now uh, what purports to be a church really needs a makeover. <laughs> oh yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. They really need a makeover. There's uh there so, seems to be so much of that going on where, People are leaving their, divorcing their wife or husband of many years and then taken off with somebody else. 
and there's no biblical grounds for the the uh, divorce, but yet the leaders or their pastors are condoning it for politics. It's because it's church politics. They don't they want to be in some of these people's good graces, especially if they have TV ministries. So it it is terrible. It is terrible what's going on and how people try to condone their actions and justify their actions. And but the Bible tells us we're supposed to judge. We're we're supposed to judge righteous judgments and mm-hmm. and uh, rebuke, correct all those things that we're supposed to do. Of course, if it's legitimate, not, you know, if you're sitting at home and you're thinking things in your head that aren't happening. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when somebody is a public figure and they're, they're openly in sin, then we certainly can judge that. Pray for, of course, pray for that person and uh, hope that they turn around before it's too late. Yeah, and I and you know, falling into sin is one thing, but apostatizing from the faith is 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 a totally different thing. And you know, when they start getting into false doctrine, who is it? Maybe it was Walter Martin who used to say that that um, that wrong living and wrong doctrine kind of go together. Yeah, they do. They and, do. And, yeah. So you can see a lot of that, and then the problem when the leader falls into these things that people can see is it's it justifies themselves saying oh well if the, if if pastor yeah. so and so can do it then why can't i oh right? yeah yeah that's so, what so, happens yeah that's the 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 worst problem as far as leadership goes because those in leadership should be of those with of good reputation yeah, above reproach yeah. yeah above reproach because not only because of their example in the church but for the world looking on yeah and that's what the problem is today is what the world is looking at on Christian television or, or in the news or whatever. They, they're thinking that that's representative of Christianity and then they can, they can just set it aside because they don't want any part of that. Well, of course, but then you, you have, uh, it's, it, it's hard to get the news media's attention as far as you're trying to get a story out for them to talk about. Uh, but they have certain things they want to talk about. For instance, we're gonna we'll play the clip of the Hill Song. This, they made this Hill Song documentary, and they and uh, now they made a documentary coming out about the Duggar family. So they they find things that they're gonna pick on people, and then they want to make the whole of Christianity like everything that every ha- ever happened in every Hill Song church, or everything the Duggar family did was horrible. And and uh, so, yeah, they're really trying to put down Christianity when it, it's not all horrible. And uh, it wasn't all horrible at every uh, Hillsong church. I'm sure there was some great people that belonged to those churches. I was in Word of Faith. I knew some great people. Yeah, we had our, doc- our doctrine was messed up. And some of the leadership was messed up, some of the people that we listened to. But it didn't make everybody bad. No, but you know it's easy to go to the you know for the critics to go for the low lying fruit, yeah. and then they can they can you know make just far sweeping everybody's like you know all all yeah Christianity this is, is this like yeah that. all Christianity they're all a bunch of hypocrites and yeah. they don't that's because they're not born again they don't understand what it feels like when Jesus changes your life radically. And you know it was Jesus because nobody else could do that. <laughs> but, you know, I, again, I, I just cautioned us about about the judging. I remember, oh, a very good friend of mine, she was uh, part of the, the Calvary Chapel movement back in the tent days and everything. And, uh, and I mean, years later, I had talked to her and, she, and I told her, yeah, I got born again. I told her when. And she goes, oh, I didn't think you were saved that early on because you were still smoking <laughs> <laughs> no no seriously because i quit uh, a few years uh, about two years later yeah but oh and that's another story in and of itself but the thing is is that um you know you so so 
people, right, when they're born again, they don't necessarily have all their doctrine together and no, everything. No, no, no. You know, these things don't just come to you through osmosis. No. Uh, so, so that's why you, I, I caution as far as, as, as judging fruit as whether that depicts a person saved or not, because everybody's in a different stage of their walk with Jesus. And when I think of the things that I fell into in the first, especially the first two years in which I was saved, because my old life just didn't want to let go. And, um, and so you, you'd stumble and fall and get up again and stumble and fall and get up again. And, and, uh, you know, I think as we're older, maybe we don't have the same temptations that we had back then. And so maybe we can look a little more holy because we don't fall into the things <laughs> that we did in the beginning. Yeah, you know, yeah. seriously, we got to think of it that way. So each, each person is different. You, you can't say that someone who's newly saved isn't saved because, you know, they don't even understand basic doctrines like the Trinity. And I mean, I've heard people and I, you know, I've been involved in the apologetic circles for so long and they're saying, well, if a person doesn't believe in, you know, the, the Trinity and all of this and they can't be saved. Well, I disagree. The Trinity is true, but how they believe Jesus died for their sins and they called out to Jesus and they were born again, but though they couldn't be saved because they don't know X, Y, and Z of their systematic theology yet. Well, no, well, they don't know everything yet. No, no, it's going to take them a while. It's it also going to take them a while to know, you know, in their own conviction of sin, what's acceptable and what's not in, in Christ. And then, of course, all they can do... I mean, I, I know, I'm like, we've had this talk before about how when we were first saved, we didn't know anything. But we, we talk, talk about Jesus everywhere, but we couldn't defend the faith because we didn't quite know it yet. But yeah. we, were, we were still born again. Yeah, so, oh yeah, uh, we were born again, no doubt about that, because yikes, yeah. you knew it, you knew it. You, Absolutely. You, the, those scales came off your eyes, Yes. and uh, you were so just... Repenting, I was repenting all the time, crying. I was repenting, repenting for my Bee Gees album. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, the Dodgers invited this group, which I think can only be described as an anti-Catholic hate group. It invited them to be everybody's, everybody's Bishop Aaron. I'm sure by now you've all heard about this controversy involving the L.A. Dodgers and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. You know, the Dodgers invited this group, which I think can only be described as an anti-Catholic hate group, invited them to be honored at, uh, at the Dodger Stadium. Then when there was a howl of protest from Catholics and others, they disinvited them, good move. But then they re-invited them, and the re-invitation was accompanied by a kind of pathetic apology where they were praised for all the great work that they do. Now look, I'm not gonna go into all the details. Look them up on YouTube or something, you'd find what they do. I'll give you one example. I think it was on Easter Sunday, uh, there was a display where they have Jesus on the cross, so the most sacred moment in history for Catholics. And a, a drag queen comes in and kind of pulls Jesus off the cross, then does a sort of uh, pole dance on the cross. For Catholics, it's hard to imagine anything more offensive than that. Suppose this group had dressed up in a kind of, you know, mockery of a, of a Muslim cleric or imam and then it desecrated the Quran. What would the reaction be? You know, those questions answer themselves, but somehow attacking Catholics in this most uh, uh, disgraceful way is okay. Not only okay, it should be honor. Why are we tolerating this? We shouldn't be tolerating it. Oh, terrible. Yeah, that was a Catholic bishop, Baron is his name. And, you know, this... <laughs> I mean, we were taught by nuns, right? I mean, yeah, we, yeah. We, Just we nuns, had some nice yeah. ones and some bad ones. Oh, but, yeah, some nice ones, yeah. Yeah, but but for them to turn it into this obscenity, which is what it is. And you know how many people will bring their children to a ball game and you you want them to see that going on. And I mean, that that's I think that's even well, it's just as bad as as these Oh, uh, what do you call it? Drag Windows. queen yeah, shows. Yeah, the drag queen story hour. Yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah, that's, that's terrible. Yes, they it is terrible. They should boycott the Dodgers. But see, this is just as bad. Well, the Angels are doing it too, so I guess it's just a California thing. I, you know. Oh I, no, I that's not. No, that shouldn't be allowed. No. Yeah, but that's just it. Is because you know the further down 
the into the pit you go, the the further you kiss keep going down. It's like a trajectory is just down from here until they hit rock bottom. But you know, again, prophetically, it's going to be as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot, when the Son of Man returns. So. The, that's why these things, as, as disgusting as they are, we're going to be like Lot feeling vexed daily for what we're seeing going around yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it sickens our souls, and especially when they target the children. And how many times have you been, well, if you've been to a ball game, half the people there are children. Yeah, that Kids seems that, to be their main target now is children. Yeah. and that makes it all the more despicable. Yeah, and you can't even understand that people would endorse any of this, any parent or grandmother or grandfather, yet people do. And yet this is particularly offensive to Catholics, but it's also offensive not just to Christians, but to anyone who has any moral standards at all, uh, you know, especially with children in the place. In fact, they say that these these drag queens that are putting on these these ex- exhibitions everywhere, um, that they will take a, a crucifix and and take the the plastic Jesus off it and then 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 start pole dancing on the cross. And and so it offends. It should offend everybody. Yeah, but, it should but, offend but everybody. But the fact that yeah. nobody, if people can still go and still support these sports teams when they do things like that. Then, then their own, then, then they have no love for the truth, and then so they will accept the lie when the big one comes down the pike, and this happens the same thing. And I mean, look at look at NFL football, and when they have these halftime shows where they have demonic, you know, de- demonic services going on at halftime. Or whatever they call it. I guess they call it. Is that what they yeah, call it's it? halftime. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you're the football fan. I'm yeah, I am. not into football. But, <laughs> you know, do they do I don't watch the those halftime shows. I don't watch the Super Bowl Is halftime that just show. Super Bowl? They That's don't. just the Super Bowl has that big halftime show. They don't really do. They don't really show halftime shows at the regular games. Okay, okay. Yeah, I it's didn't, just I Super didn't Bowl. Know. They do. Well, I don't know why they waste their time on some of these people when there's there's some talented people out there that could put on a good show, but I don't, I don't know who the producers are. But yeah, talk about, here's this Harari guy talking about God is dead. We don't have to wait until Christ's second coming uh, in order to overcome death. A couple of geeks in a laboratory can do it if you give them enough <laughs> time and money. You have a lovely passage where you say, looking at the world today, God seems to be making a comeback, but this is a mirage. God is dead. It just takes a while to get rid of the body. (laughs) I don't think life has any meaning. Um, So, so in in that sense, it's 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 not it's not it's not a strong counter argument. I know that many religions and philosophies have based the meaning of life on death and what what happens after death, but I think these are all fictional stories that people have invented uh, through history. They are not the truth. Yeah, he's going to find out one day. Mm. And yet he's a leading speaker for the World Economic Forum. Yeah, the New World Order, yeah. Yes, with yeah, and the New World Order. With and that Charles, a, Ch- is it Klaus Schwab. Yes, Klaus yeah, Schwab. Yeah, he's the, one of the main speakers where all the world leaders go, and they listen to this guy. Here's another one of his quotes. You think about uh, the Bible, for example. So in the first book of Genesis, what God does is to create animals and plants and humans. And we now want to gain this ability to ourselves to manufacture uh, animals and, and, and plants and humans. And we even go beyond God. I mean, even if you believe in the Bible, the only thing the God of the Bible managed to create is organic beings. Uh, he managed to create the cows and the tomatoes and the giraffes and the humans, all organic. Now we try to go beyond the God of the Bible and create inorganic life, something he never managed to do, either according to the Bible or according to, uh, to, to, to biology. For four billion years, all of life was organic, and now we want to create inorganic life. That's, that's really, divinity is, is not far enough to describe what we are trying to do. The soul and the afterlife and and things like that, the main 
uh, task of God was to ensure agricultural production and victory in war. If you read really the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, it's all about agricultural production. It's about rain, it's about pestilence, it's about fertility. And now we are much better than the God of the Bible. I mean, in, in, in the Bible, you have these recurring droughts that the, as, as the people of Israel do something wrong, gods become angry, drought, no water. <laughs> now, uh, Israel has built, in recent years, a huge desalinization factory on the shores of the Mediterranean. And most drinking water in Israel today actually come from, from these plants, from these factories. So we can make God as angry as we like. I mean, he can stop the rains, we don't care. We still have water because science has managed to do to go way beyond the expectations of the ancient Hebrews. Wow. Do you know, isn't it ironic that the first chapter of Romans absolutely discredits everything he said in verse 20? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, and then, of course, in Colossians, uh, speaking of Jesus, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So he is he's wrong. He has to go to, to Genesis to show the creation when all, you know, as if that was the beginning of God. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, God had no beginning. Yeah. So this guy... Well, you know, you don't get your theology from this homosexual that is is debased and yeah, has been debased. totally yeah. given over and has a seared conscience. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, if you're going to talk like that, oh, we don't need God. We're gonna we're gonna do better than God. Yeah, you'll see. Yeah, you you'll see. You're going to be in for one big surprise. I know, and we'll be watching from the mezzanine. You know. Oh. <laughs> And, and, you know, I would like to throw a lightning bolt directly at the guy myself. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty sad state of affairs that he's being invited to all these big uh, conferences and that people are taking this guy seriously. Oof. He hates, he hates God. He hates Christ. Yeah. And, um, and that's because he doesn't want, he, that's because his sin, he loves his sin. And so he, he, he can't find, he doesn't even want repentance because he enjoys his life, you know, or whatever. And, um, well, of course, and he's famous now and he's in demand. So hard he, to believe. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's hard to believe. There's no <laughs> appeal. The guy's repugnant, repulsive. Yeah. Ugh, but yet they applaud it. him at these events. Yeah. Oh yeah, he'll be sitting there with Bill Gates and and John Kerry and yeah. the rest of them, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's demonic, and what's going on in our world right now is, you know, is Satan knowing his time is short, and he's just bringing it all together, and all of his his people who he's whose souls he owns. They're all working for him. Yeah, they're all working for him, and they, they can't, they're out of the closet now. They don't try to hide who they're working for. Yeah. Nah, it's his day. This is his time. And it's short. Yeah, it's short. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Here's a little clip that we have. There were some Hill things song. that I really, really liked about the documentary and then other things that literally just bugged the mess out of me. So let's start there. Let's start with the bad, and then we'll move on to the good. So as soon as I started watching it, it didn't take a long time during the first episode for me to realize that this was a low-key hit piece on Christianity. It was clear that the people who made this documentary were assuming that their audience would be leftists who had an axe to grind with Christianity. Now, maybe it's just me, but I found this to be pretty annoying because they complained in the documentary about how Hillsong would bait and switch their audience when it came to LGBT issues. Well, they did the exact same thing to me. This documentary was not what I was expecting for it to be. Over and over, they would start off with talking about Carl Lentz or Hillsong, and then they would slowly start moving over into saying how Christianity is the real problem because it's run by white conservative men in positions of power. This was a constant theme in the series. 
For example, Black Lives Matter came up a lot and they constantly talked about how Christians weren't affirming of black lives. But when Carl Lentz, a younger white man, affirmed the lives of black people and didn't affirm the organization, they still found a way to turn that into a little jab towards Christianity. They had a girl on there who was talking about whether it's LGBT issues or Black Lives Matter, how Christianity is always behind. So therefore it wasn't revolutionary when Carl Lentz said that Black Lives Matter because he only gets a claim for saying Black Lives Matter because Christianity is so backwards. But for me personally, whenever they talk like this, they made it clear to me that the people involved in this documentary seem to not be aware that there's actually a lot of black Christian churches in America relative to the size of the black population. They acted as if it was a feature of Christianity to have a church that's run by greedy, controlling, white, conservative men with sinister intentions. There was even a part in there when they mentioned how Hillsong would send 26-year-old white men and put them in places like New York as a way to, and I quote, colonize the area. How is that <laughs> not colonization to literally ignore a full group of people? Wow. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was a, a man with a, with a YouTube channel, and he's, a, he's an African-American guy that doesn't like what is going on in this, this documentary that's talking about Hillsong acting like it's, you know, the producers think that they're being, you know, fair, and they're not being fair. They're using problems within Hillsong in order to in, impugn all of Christianity. Yeah. Well, so yeah, they focused on it. Carl Lentz. If if it's a documentary that I saw, it was okay. it was mainly about him. Hours of ta talking about him. Well, he was, and he's not the whole uh, the body of Christ. Body yeah. of Christ, and he certainly wasn't all the thousands of members that belong to uh, the Hillsong churches. So yeah. It's ridiculous. They they don't. They're very biased, and I don't like that kind of a documentary. I want give me some meat. There was a, there there was a lot of uh, milk in that documentary. Yeah. It wasn't meat. It wasn't yeah. meaty. I didn't see it, but this man's commentary I found very interesting. That he pointed out that it was just really it was just an excuse to tear down Christianity. Yeah. And Christianity in its position against things like same-sex marriage and in the... Yeah, they the focus on those stuff. things, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is also fascinating on the topic we were talking about, that what happened, what's really still going on right now in the United Methodist Church, that they have divided over that issue, you know, over should they, should they have same-sex weddings and things like that, and and gay clergy. And so now there's been a total split. Now you've got the the Methodist church which is, you know, which is the ones that, you know, want to be liberal and all of that and then the ones leaving are calling themselves the global Methodist church that they want to, you know, uphold the traditions of John Wesley, you know, the founder of Methodism. So, um I'm glad that's happening, but um but to stay in a church that that is woke and promotes all of these sort of things, and then how can they sit there and sing the hymns of the church <laughs> and with a straight face? Yeah, well, they do it. They do it. They do it. They're, they, that's they're, unbelievable. You'd have to have a seared conscience to be able to do that. Well, obviously. Obviously, they have a seared conscience, but they feel good because they're going to church. And so, yeah, wow. so they may, they feel like they're a Christian because they're going to church and they're quoting Bible scriptures. Some they don't like too much, like Romans one. No, they don't like they don't like that one. But yeah, so when when you when you see these documentaries, they focus on uh, these the LBGTQ or rights and oh, they focused on somebody's adultery where that's not going on with every single pastor and every single minister. I'm sure there was some lovely people. I, Being in Word of Faith for 15 years, I knew some great people that loved the Lord with all their heart. We just didn't have our doctrine straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, or practice. That's the bigger issue, you know, with, with the Pentecostalism, is the practices that are unbiblical, such as group tongues, where there's no interpretation 
and uh, you know, and all of the crazy stuff. Oh, oh yeah, we were into we we were into hyper, hyper char- charismatic signs and wonders, signs yeah, and wonders, chasing yeah, was, signs and wonders, which yeah. Jesus says it's the that only the evil uh, chase after yeah. after signs. So, and he says, no signs going to be given to them except for the sign of Jonah. So, you know. Oh, there was but, always so many signs and wonders that. And we makes were you wonder. Like, yeah, and we and we did wonder. We go, oh wow, <laughs> angels! There was like wonder. they were passing around this tape one time where people were in a in a worship service, and then the choir of angels was in the background, and you could hear the angels singing. We'd go, wow. <laughs> Oh. oh, some yeah. Some of the stories were were pretty wild, especially the the heaven, the people going to heaven and people going to hell and coming back and t- talking about it. But oh yeah, oh yeah. My husband wrote a book about that called Heaven Can't Wait. Oh, or Heaven Can Wait, which is it was the opposite of the movie. But anyhow, yeah. Those things happen a lot because, and they always, oh, the exaggerations. Yeah, I mean, it's a, they must be tripping on LSD or something, some of these people, because they, they make up, they have some good stories. You know who could spin the best yarns in that way was was R.W. Shambach. And I'll never forget, in fact, I, I think I put this in my Great Apostasy video where Shambach is talking about, they were saying, what was the greatest? He was, you know, an understudy for A.A. A. Allen. Yeah. What, what was the greatest miracle you ever saw? You know, and he'd give these A.A. A. Allen stories like, like, you know, fingers growing back right in front of everybody or, um, or somebody insulted A.A. A. Allen. And then all of a sudden he they dropped cannot, dead, right? Yeah. No, they couldn't speak anymore. Oh. And so the guy came <laughs> back the next day and, and signing that he's sorry. And then A.A. A. Allen let him speak again. And so he's telling, <laughs> and so the show that, that, and I have this on tape, the show that that Shambach is saying all these crazy things, then uh, the next guest on was, was Oral Roberts. And, and it's funny because the, 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 the host, it was, was uh, Paul Crouch Jr. was hosting this Praise the Lord show. And Paul Crouch looks at, um, at, 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 uh, oh, Dr. Roberts, you know, ain't no doctor, but anyway, yeah, yeah. uh, at Oral Roberts and says, well, what is the greatest miracle you ever saw? You know, he was waiting for him to upstage Shambach with all of that, right? And uh, because really A.A. A. Allen was a contemporary of Oral Roberts. But yeah. so, so Oral says, well, he talked about this little boy and the little boy, boy he, he, he was annoyed because the little boy stopped and said, I need prayer because, you know, I... Uh, something about I can't remember exactly. I think it was it was he was in an accident and and he could no longer walk, and so uh, Oral just didn't even want to mess with him. He was just annoyed, so he said a quick prayer and left. And then a year later, he came back around and did another rally in that same town, and you know, the little boy who had injured his legs or whatever was there and he was walking. <laughs> and so, and so, and so it's like Paul Jr. looked shocked. Like that was the greatest thing because of course the guy just, just, you know, recovered and came back. But that was what, 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 or it was like a moment of truth with Oral Roberts. You know, it wasn't some instant healing. In fact, even Oral says, oh, I left. I didn't see anything different, but he came back the next year and he was fine. <laughs> I thought he was going to say, when I saw the hundred foot Jesus. Oh. Or is it ninety foot? I don't know, but one of those. Or nine hundred. I think it was nine hundred foot. Well, yeah, one of those foot he saw. Like, how yeah. would you even know that? How, did you measure? Like, Jesse Duplantis just came out with a testimony. He saw a thirty foot angel. How would he even know the angel yeah, was yeah. thirty feet? Did he have a yardstick on him? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but that angel was, was thirty funny. feet. Be- because Oral has spent all these yarns too, like you say. I mean, yeah, it was give all this money or I die, you know, kind of things. And for him to say something honest like that, that was the best he could come up with on the spot, was absolutely hysterical. Because of course the kid recovered, you know, after a year. So I, I just thought that was funny, because especially after the story, the A. A. Allen story with the fingers growing back and the man going mute. Oh um, yeah, like yeah, yeah, he he had some great uh, powers like that. A. A. Allen, it, it, he was a pimp, he was a pimp preacher, and so was Shambach. If you go back and look at some of the old videos, a scamming people out of money, 
doing the miracle selling and that kind of thing. They were doing it back then. It was disgusting. So I don't admire any of these people. Uh, anybody that does the miracle selling, we should just count them out. You don't listen to those people. Just forget it. If they start telling you, give $1,000 and you'll get this and you'll get that. And uh, it's an abomination. So we need to totally discount people. It's it's amazing that people still respect Shambach and Oral Roberts the way they do. Oh, I know. I was shocked when David Reagan was uh, defending Oral Roberts and had his one of his daughters on his show. And, uh, you know, he's with Lamb and Lion Ministries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Lion and Lamb. And, and, uh, and I wrote him a letter, and he... Uh, and and he, I don't know if it was just me, but he, but a lot of people wrote him, and he was slamming those who wrote him. You know that they weren't very Christ-like and blah blah blah. Um, but you know you don't defend a man, a, a, a con man. No, like you Earl can't Roberts. defend a con man. He was a con man. He was a con man. Yeah, and you can't yeah. defend that. That's that's one of the big problems that we have in the church today. Now this this conning is is so rampant. And so no, there's not that many people defending it uh, or speaking out against it, I mean. And so it goes on. But if people would take a stand and say, no, no, that's not Christianity. We have to stop that. And we don't promote those people. It would stop. Yeah, but you know what they say about lying? Liars have to, um, you know, they have to compete with themselves with their own lies. Every time they tell a lie, it takes more lies to cover for the past lies. And then, and then, you know, they've got to upstage themselves and tell a bigger one next time. And so that's how these stories just, you know, keep, keep going out and getting bigger and better because they got to be better than the next guy or better than the last story they told. Yeah, it doesn't end well. It didn't end well for Oral. They wound up losing their university. They were $50 million in debt. So Seed Faith didn't work for him. And mm-hmm. Richard got kicked out of uh, being the president of the university. So they lost a big piece of their wealth. I'm sure they still have money stashed yeah. away. But he was another one of those that was caught him in what oh Rob or or Oral Roberts' son Robert or Richard Roberts. He and his wife were taking vacations on the company's jet. You know, we were talking about Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they were caught doing that oh, too. Oh yeah, that was, yeah, they were just oh they were living the high yeah. life over there. Oh. Yeah. And then they they uh, yeah, and then the university was fifty million dollars in debt, which uh-huh. they didn't care. They just were spending like, oh, this is our money. But thank God that uh, they did get kicked out, and uh, it, it was an embarrassment. He later got arrested for drunk driving. Richard, so you know he wasn't happy. <laughs> yeah, his mug shots all over the internet. Yeah, so it it's a sad state of affairs. Uh, when uh, a couple years ago, when Lindsay Roberts was in Tampa, she was at Randy White's church after Randy lost his big building. He was in this, in this dumpy, moldy church. I just I went there just to see what it was like and to see how many people would show up for Lindsay Roberts. There wasn't thirty people there. <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Their, their star has fallen. Yeah, their star has fallen. So no, they don't at- attract the. Of course, this was maybe about 10 years ago, so I don't know. I, I, they're on television now. They have a pretty good television ministry because it's expensive to be on TV, and they're on uh, quite a few channels, so they're able to pay their television bills anyway. All right, let's talk about Lance Wall now, now <laughs> and Kim Clement. Here we go. I'm not into corporate stuff anymore. I'm in, I'm in the church mountain. I'm seven mountains. I'm a teacher, a prophet. I, I like to do that. And the Lord said to me, as I'm thinking, I'm not involved with race. I'm not involved with politics. I'm not involved with Donald Trump. The Lord told me this. He said, every time you pray in tongues, you tell me this is what you want to do. Because this is a ministry that teaches you get filled with the Spirit and pray in tongues. Right. Now, I, I found something out. Our tongues have been walking us into chapters we didn't know were written for us. That's right. For the last year, the fruit and the root is being exposed of something that could take down America. Yes, America shall be saved, but at what price? How much of America will be left? Donald Trump says it. 
But I believe, and that reminds me of something Kim Clement prophesied. And he said, the Lord, when he raised up Donald Trump, he says, I am dissatisfied with both parties. In this characteristic South African way, I am dissatisfied, the Lord says, with both parties. And what I'm going to do will be an irritant to the Democrats and, and, and it will be discomforting to the Republicans. In other words, what God's doing is raising up a populist movement that will not make either party comfortable. And you may be weak now, but you're getting stronger every day. You're getting... Give yourself a hand. Amen. It's a movement. It is. And then the preachers are worried because the movements, they don't want us to get involved with politics. Preachers still, I've preached two sermons to a room full of apostles and prophets, two separate events this week. The subject, can you explain why we should be involved with politics? Why you should be involved? That's like, why should I be involved with a parachute when a plane goes down? What are you talking about? Yeah, right. So, so the, uh, so where we're at now is, I believe, even the Flashpoint Army. I could see, and couldn't you see it? Rallies that are actually people, because we had it happen at your event. People will come in thinking they're going to a political rally. It ends up being a Holy Ghost revival. Well, the point is, who says you can't have both? That's right. That's right. Right? Yeah, that was Lance Wallnell, prophet Lance Wallnell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a and new this, title. These are the type of guys that you know that really have the ear of of uh, Donald Trump. Yeah, and, and so when you're with, you know, the only way in, like you know, you you've reported umpteen million times about about Paula White, is you have to get in through Paula White if if there are any Christians that want to be around Trump. And Trump takes these prophets seriously yeah, as, he as does. far as thinking that they can help him get real or, you know, with the elections and everything. But and supposedly and then they promote Kim, the, the late Kim Clement. He, he died, what, about 10 years ago or whenever. And and the thing is, he supposedly prophesied that that, uh, you know, Trump was going to be president. Yeah, I'm going to play a couple of those clips. Okay, but before you do, I want to quote from him from from back in. We'll see how his record goes. Yeah, this is what he said on the Praise the Lord program on uh, let's see, July fifth, two thousand seven. Okay, this is two thousand seven. This is a year before the uh, before Obama was elected, and this is where he's talking about the coming election. And uh, it has nothing to do with Trump, but people will even say that he predicted Trump would be president by by this particular so-called prophecy that he gave on that show, which, again, I have some I have a whole thing somewhere in my collection. But but just a, a, a couple paragraphs of what he said, then you can get an idea of, you know, the kinds of things where he tried to act like he was prophesying when he was just going on, eh, you know, his own impulses, put it that way. Yeah. That they, kind of a mess he's but first of all you know he's he 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 admits that he's not always right like he <laughs> said he says in the show, here's what he says in the show he says he says you know we have people saying hey you have prophecies that didn't come to pass and i tell him i know but i have hundreds that have oh yeah hundreds. And, and you see that's something that that john wimber let you know, that he gave them the, you know, saying New Testament prophets don't have to be 100 percent. They can be 50 50 if they want. So yeah, that yeah, yeah. that's part of the John Wimper fruit. And then he says to to Matt and Laura, Lori, he says, God said to me that the person who gets elected, speaking of the coming election, will look like a person who is not a Christian or a real believer like we understand. He says, but I'll trick the people. And when he gets into the Oval Office, he will fill him with the Holy Spirit. He may not stand up and speak in tongues. He's not going to come stand and shake and stuff. We're not going to really see it except in policy and things. But I know who it is. I'm not scared to say who it is, But though he doesn't. But what if it doesn't happen? The will of the people. It can change it. I prophesied the re-election of President Bush, and I was unashamed to say. So here he is, the next president that he is saying is going to be, you're not going to know he's a believer, but God's going to fill yeah, him with yeah, spirit. Well, well, yeah. that, was, that, was, that was Obama. 
Yeah. How did that go? Yeah. That didn't go very, that really didn't go very well. And so here's another statement he said on that show. He says, the prophetic word opens up a whole new world out there for you to be enticed. God entices you with a future. That's the glory of the future. He entices you. Remember something. He wants you there. He says he's going to get you there and he's going to lure you there, you know, wherever he wants you. Mm. So that's not a good representation of our God. No he doesn't way. lure no. and entice. No, no. So, so uh, in his book that's called, um, they, well, let me see, I've got it over here. <clears throat> you think I'm crazy, but oh, no, let me, it says, call me crazy, but I'm hearing God. He goes on in that book to identify God as one and the same as the quote, law of attraction. <gasps> And so, mm. you know, I, I, I won't go into all those quotes because I have them all written down here. But it's it's true. If you look at that book, you can see that that in, in several places he refers to the law of attraction as God. So he was really a, a, a merger of new age. And I, of course, have always compared him to Nostradamus because Nostradamus, whom he quotes in a favorable way, also in his book, as, as he does, as he does Fatima apparition. Uh, so those are the things that, that Kim Clement was all about. In fact, he got his, you know, he had his abilities when he saw a psychic, when he was a child that his mother took him to. And so it's, he really was a merger of all these awful things. And, and he's a lot like Nostradamus that his, you know, Nostradamus had these quatrains, they called it where he was, you know, he, it was, it was very, shadowy you couldn't tell what he was talking about but you could read something into it later and that's kind of kind of the same way that Kim Clement operated and so people have him saying and prophesying things that he was not specific on just by reading something into it yeah and so that's kind of how you have to do it but the thing is they both both Nostradamus and Kim Clement uses use astrology and occultism and all of those things. And, and both of them said, oh, I can't be accurate. You know, maybe, maybe I'll be 50-50. Yeah. Well, that's not how it goes. No, not biblically. Not biblically. Oh, well, here we are. Lance Wall now talks about him and Clement going to meet with Donald Trump before the election. The Christians that led me to Kim Clement, who was what I heard was the most radical and unique prophetic voice uh, in America. And so he came up and visited a little church I was in in Rhode Island, and we developed this great friendship. And I, I saw him as an end-time um, Elijah-like character who had a voice for a new era that he was inaugurating and a new sound and a new kind of definition of prophetic engagement within culture. We became very close friends. I got to be a board member. We traveled a lot together. And he blasted me out of my little world of pastoring and teaching and brought me into uh, an entirely different dimension. Now, when Kim had the, that disastrous brain bleed that, that took place, we were supposed to meet at the Trump Towers together. And we were talking about our meeting. And I went and met Trump without Kim. And what people don't realize is that when Kim was not accessible, I had a panic attack because people wanted to know what about Donald Trump and Kim was supposed to deliver the message. Well, he was kind of like coping between life and death. I didn't know the whole story, but I, 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 I'll tell you this because you'd, you'd appreciate and understand its validity. I started to hear the voice. It was like Kim talking in my ear, but it was his angel, I think. And it was that was the next president of the United States would be Isaiah 45 president. And I, I did, it was so clear that I thought it was a demon. I honestly thought I'd never hear that clearly. The next president would be Isaiah 45. So I went to Google to go look up what the next number is. And I found out that Barack Obama was 44, but the next president is 45. So then I go to Isaiah, open up Isaiah 45, and it says, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, whom I've anointed. I believe Kim would have prophesied it, but since he didn't, uh, it's like, boom, it just flopped over on me. I was supposed to be at that meeting. And so I start hearing God, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's unusual because I'm hearing like the prophet heard. And I say uh, out loud, I start saying that Donald Trump is the modern-day Cyrus. Now, the reason why that's important is because 
Uh, right around the time of, uh, of uh, the debates that were going on in September, October, before the election, you remember Hillary Clinton and the Democrat machine dug up this disastrous Access Hollywood video transcript of 10 years earlier, which has him talking about grabbing women's genitals. And, well, it was it was a assassination of him as a president. Yes. And I had just released a book mm -hmm. based on what I believe I was hearing about about Cyrus that I think was tied into Kim's prophetic anointing. And I said, this man is a modern day Cyrus. We must stand and observe what God is doing. He is not coming from us. Cyrus wasn't a Jew. God raised him up as an outsider for the sake of his people. Isaiah 45. And and I'm um, in Jerusalem when the Access Hollywood video came out. And when it came out, it was like a punch to the stomach because I just published a book about God's chaos candidate, Donald Trump. And I was really convinced that uh, I, I was hearing. But your, your father, Donnie, wasn't there for me to confirm things with. So I was totally hanging out there based on everything he taught me in the prophetic, basically. <laughs> Whoa. So, yeah, wow. Yeah, in fact, I looked it up. Uh, he died November 23rd, 2016. Okay. And he had been, like, in coma and everything. He had been sick for a very long time, you know, after he'd had the hemorrhage yeah. in his brain. Yeah, and, um, yeah, he never recovered from that. Yeah, he never, he never recovered. And But yet, why are they still bringing him up and you know, it's like, it's like they've they've kind of made a legend out out of him. Yeah, yeah, they super canonized him. But you know, but if you read his book, "Call Me Crazy," but I'm hearing God, you you, you get to see what his God was all about. Like, here's a a quote from page two hundred two. He says, when God speaks to you, doors that were open close and close doors open. The law of attraction is implemented and people are drawn to you to grant you favor. And yes, unfortunately, to insult you in order to stop you. Once the future is in you, the law of attraction is implemented and people are drawn to you and they cannot explain it. It's mysterious, alluring and fascinating. It's something they're not familiar with. It is God unexplained, pure and unscathed by human vanity vernacular you know and so he is you know comparing the again the law of attraction you know is is god he even says that in in his book that the law of attraction is god um and and you know the oh and here's his here's his his what he says about uh, Nostradamus on page 92, he says, throughout history, there have been many prophets and some of these, such as Nostradamus, who lived during the 16th century, have made interesting predictions concerning world events. So, you know, Nostradamus was into the occult. And in fact, you know, you can, you, you know, view, and he was demonized. He was a very demonized man. And they said, I, I've read this before, but I was looking this up on Wikipedia and it quotes him saying, them saying that he, when he was dying, he took all his occult books and started burning them and some kind of, you know, spirits were coming out of the fireplace and everything. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so, so this isn't something to emulate. And yet he speaks, he, he, he refers to Nostradamus as a prophet. So yeah, well, they had uh, this. Uh, Clay Clark does these reawaken America tours, and he invites like General Flynn and Steve Bannon and a lot of people that were associated with Trump and still associated. So they have Kim Clement's daughter as one of the featured speakers, and of course she talks about her father. But here's a, a clip of her. What are people saying? Someone had you guys. asked, um, had Trump seen your dad's prophecies? Yes, yes, he absolutely has 100% sure. And I know that because, thank you, Clay Clark and his wife, Vanessa, who made sure to sit down with Donald Trump and show him the prophecies. And so I know Wait, wait, sure. wait, they did this before he died? No, 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 no. Uh, Clay Clark and his wife, Vanessa, just earlier this year. Oh, 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 yes, yes. They yes, sat yes. down with Donald Trump and showed him... Well, he'd seen them before. He'd asked me to put together things and have it sent to him. I've done that before. But they actually sat with him and were able to explain the prophetic. Because the thing about the prophetic is someone like Donald Trump, who may be a Christian in the traditional sense, probably be as familiar with how, uh, on the evangelical side, how the prophetic worked. Although I think he understands it a little bit more than I thought, because 
he's been around a lot of prophetic people. He, yeah. he agreed to meet with my dad in the first place. Lance Wall now prophesied over him. Um, there's a lot of people, I'm trying to think of people's names and they're escaping me, but there's ministry leaders who, who operate in the prophetic who have been around him, so I know he does. But I, because Clay and Vanessa know me and they know my dad's prophecy so well and, and they understand that from their time with me over the past year, they were able to really, while he sat there watching, answer questions. And so that's what I know. I wasn't there. They called me right afterwards from the car. They said, hey! <laughs> so that was really cool. It was a really great day. But yes, he has seen them. Uh, he has seen the prophecies. And of course, Eric... Uh, has been there when I've presented them, Eric, his son, Eric Trump. Uh, and I met Eric, uh, it's over a year ago now, in Ohio. Was I in Ohio? I think I was in Ohio. Yes, I was. It was very cold. And that's right. It was snowing. It was snowing, that's right. But I met Eric, and that was the first time he'd seen them. And I know he hadn't really seen them before, because he kept saying, how come I've never heard of this? What did he say? How did he know? We didn't know. So the, the cool thing about it is we were able to, and so was Clay and Vanessa, uh, particularly Clay and Vanessa were able to say to him, to Donald Trump, this is what this means, this is how the, this works. And at one point, I think they were watching Donald and Clark, a man named Donald, a man named Clark, and the, Clay Clark and Donald Trump were actually sit, sitting next to each other with a computer in front of them, and my dad, he plays the prophecy, and my dad points at them and says, there's a man named Donald and a man named Clark, you're both watching me. And Donald Trump, I think, if I'm remembering That's correctly, curious, yeah. turned to Clay Clark and said, is he talking about us, like, right now? <laughs> and they're like, yes! So what's cool about that is that my dad literally looked through time and saw that moment. And that moment wasn't until after 2020 election. This was just earlier this year. So in that prophecy, he said, you're both watching me, and you're asking, is God speaking to me? And my dad yes, says, he yes, he is. And, uh, and then he goes on about the American flag, and then he says, and when it comes time for the election, you will be elected. So now we have another confirmation. Yeah. So we have two terms prophesied for Maricopa County, and then we have Donald and Clark actually sitting together watching my dad. And through time, my dad says, man named Donald, man named Clark, both watching me. You want to know if God's speaking to you? Yes, he is. And guess what? You're going to win the election. <laughs> if you have to That's ask. what's so cool about prophecy, right? Because my dad, there's no way my dad could have known that. That God did that. And all God needs really is a vessel that's willing to open their mouth and speak. Wow. Well, then that brings me to another quote of Kim Clement and what he, how he describes prophecy. Because, and again, this is, I, I'm not saying that he didn't hear from voices or hear things and say things. And even if things, you could read something into it, but he was, he was really in the wrong source. Here's, the quotes. This one is from page 122 of his crazy book. He says, kinesthetic sensing is a modern term for discerning divine communications through physical sensation. It is a fascinating way to hear God. This involves movement, fragrances, temperature, temperature changes, and feelings of pain and other sensations. And then on page 125, a couple pages later, he says, hearing God can be compared with listening to a radio. You have to tune in to his voice. He's always speaking. We just have to find the right radio wave to hear his voice. God doesn't suddenly start speaking. His word is already in the atmosphere and it is up to us to tune in. <laughs> now, 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 you see, he always said that what he was doing with his music, because he was quite a pianist. Yeah, he was, yeah. That he was, he said this over and over and over again, that he was creating the prophetic atmosphere with his music. Yeah, and he did, too. It was, yes. it was spooky. It was, like, it was like creepy. He would brag that he would get so anointed with the piano that he would get blood all over the ivories because <gasps> of he, his fingers would bleed oh. and he was taken over by something. So this yeah, it was kind of weird music. Up. Oh, and and you know what? And he did go into some sort of weird trance. Yeah, yeah. With the piano playing, and so yeah, they had he, a weird he was beat. Into boom, some boom, 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 boom. Yes. And he was into very metaphysical, weird stuff. And and you could see by who he looked up to, like Nostradamus and, and the, the apparitions of Mary and all of those things. And not to mention it, the psychic in South Africa that he boasts about that first, you know, noticed this gift in him or whatever and said it came through the family line. Um, 
this no one even vets the guy. I mean, it's there in his book. I mean, come on. He wrote one autobiography. Call me crazy. Yeah. It, but I'm hearing God. Well, his version of God, which he identifies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not only does I, he identify him as the law of attraction, but the law of attraction came out of a book called The Secret. And and that was channeled from a spirit being named Abraham. And, and the thing is, he even called his ministry The Secret. So he he's pretty clear about the occult source of his power. But he had the power. It was just... A diabolical one. Yeah, it was diabolical. He also called his church the Den. <laughs> yeah, the Den. That was the specific one in, in Detroit, I believe, was the Den. And then you had the secret. So he used all those terms out of out of, you know, that that evil book called The Secret. And it was very popular around ten years ago. And Yeah, was, you don't you know, hear about it. In fact they did so a movie. Now. I think they made it into a movie. They made this I didn't see it, but yeah, it was a, it was a it was a bestseller. And oh yeah, it was a bestseller. Yeah, and of course they promoted yeah. it. Yeah, and they promoted it on the Oprah Winfrey show. Yeah, and Oprah yeah, she was promoted totally it. Into yeah. It. yeah, yeah, and into the law of attraction. Oh boy, so you know this is this is the one that they are doing now at the political rallies. They're promoting him. Yeah, to get, to get Trump elected. Yeah. Okay, it's come full circle now. This is. You know what? I mean, it really convinces me to stay out of politics because the devil gets in on both sides. Oh, he, yeah. He, the, he's got the, it covered. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, who... These guys are so compromised. Yeah, he's got both sides covered. Yeah, he's got both sides covered, yeah. Because I don't see any... They, they can prophesy all they want, and yet Trump goes and speaks for Mrs. Moon and praises her... Uh, somebody that claims to be God. So, yeah, it's sick. Yeah, and it, he, bow, he bows before St. Pope John Paul II's blood sample. Yeah, he bows, he, you know, he kneels down in front of that and prays. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Why aren't they talking about that? They want to talk about all this fluffy stuff and these prophecies, and then he's Cyrus, and he's God's man, and he's anointed. No, God's man and... A person that's anointed doesn't. We don't do those kind of things. We don't kneel before someone's blood, and we don't praise cult leaders that call themselves God. <laughs> yeah, right. Or the or the only begotten daughter of God. Yeah, right? yeah. The only begotten daughter who, uh, if you look into the history even of the uh, moons, and right now the Japanese some uh, people in Japan they have a big following in Japan. They're being sued. The Unification Church. The Moonies, they're being sued by a group of people uh, for mind control and scamming them out of their money and whatever. So hopefully this suit will, will uh, they'll be successful in being able to uh, get some money back. There's been multiple million, hundreds of millions of dollars that have been taken from the Japanese people to enrich these people. And so also... They say that at one time, when they when they first started this cult years ago, many years ago, that the the women had to sleep with the uh, head of the cult to it was a purification cer- mm. uh, ceremony because they say that they they um, Reverend Moon, as he called himself, could cleanse you of original sin if you got married in the unification church then your children could be born sinless and then after that he the, he decided who had had to marry who within whom within his congregation yeah. remember the, yeah. he joined a thousand couples yeah he or had something those like mass weddings time. yeah yeah the mass wedding and and yet you know if she was saving herself for her wedding night that that you know Having to sleep with the cult leader first really didn't wasn't very nice for the husband. <laughs> no, but it was a ritual, and it was uh, there was a book that was put out uh, by someone that was close to Moon, and I'll get I'll see if I can get something about the two Marys. But you can read the book on uh, if you go to archive.org, 
you could read just about any book there for free. And the book was there. And he goes into detail about some of the things that happened during the formation of this church when Moon real, uh, came out and said he was the Messiah and he was the Lord of the Second Advent. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you got married, mar- the, the only way you could be saved is if you got married and had children in the Unification Church. It, it's mm-hmm. really sick, and it, it, it just goes to show you, though, what politicians will do for money. For vote. Yeah, for votes. Yeah, for votes. <laughs> for votes. Yeah. They'll, they'll say anything. They'll say, sure. they'll say anything. And... So and then you have these people praising uh, these politicians and calling them Cyrus and God's anointed and yeah it's it's pretty sick really but thank God for discernment and that the Lord's opened our eyes anyway and we hope to open other people's eyes because you see these political rallies especially these the reawaken America tour and this uh, flashpoint that they have Gene Bailey and Lance Wall now and Hank Kuhneman and, oh, they're going to save America. And people mm. get so excited over saving America. And when I look at it now and I think to myself, why aren't people this excited about heaven, about getting people saved? And uh, they're not that excited about the things of God. They're more excited about uh, getting Trump reelected and saving America. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know the thing is, is that Trump is ex- is is accepting their praise. Yeah, and, and everything. Yeah, and um, you know the thing is, people don't understand how all of these particular NAR prophets are believing that they are going to end up you know, really ruling the world and then Jesus can come. It's the dominion theology. And uh, it's like, okay, and one of their big prophets, who is a friend of Lance Walnow's, by the way, is a guy named Bill Hammond. In fact, he's the apostle of the apostles, okay? And so I have um, a report of of his from, oh boy, this is back in 1999, where he's talking about how we're getting now we're getting into this new era, which is just another way of saying new age. But um, but anyway, he says that that the apostles and prophets, they're coming back. They're going to be even though the foundation was already laid by the apostles and prophets, they're topping off the building now. (laughs) And then he says we are in the midst of uh, of what is the 40 to 50 year transition uh, the one final generation that'll take us into the fullness of the kingdom of God on earth. He says, but uh, we must do so in cooperation with ushering in his kingdom. We are preparing to move into the age of kingdom rule and dominion and uh, where we will, you know, will reign on the earth. And so uh, this is, and he says, this is going to be a paradigm shift. That's yeah. Yeah. That was big. That, that was, was a, a big term at one time. You don't hear it so much anymore, but... Yeah, he says, we are about to move from the dispensation of grace to the dispensation of dominion. (laughs) Okay, and so these are the kind of guys that that fuel and give the theology to these false prophets, people like Bill Hammond, who I like to call Haman, you know? Yeah. (laughs) But... Because because this is the evil that is it within the church that is playing into the political side of things. Because, again, Cyrus is going to restore the kingdom, you see. And yeah, that's well, that's it. Want. Cyrus is going to restore the kingdom. Yeah. Right, right. And they're the ones that are going to lead it. Yeah, and they're going to lead it. Uh, by the way, the, the book uh, that talks about this whole purification thing with Trump, I mean, not Trump, with Moon, is the tragedy of the six Marys? It's hmm. called the tragedy of the six Marys, and it's a, a biography, really, but a testimony of this man that was a close associate of Moon when they when they practiced this. They tried to cover it up and say that they didn't they didn't do this practice, but I believe I believe the eyewitness testimony, 
And uh, it sounds like something somebody with a messiah complex would do anyway. Where, yeah, well, there's a lot of historical revisionism going on all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons, and I'm sure it, it, you know, again, with the books that you wrote about Paula White and the one I wrote on about Christian television, I wrote it so that there wouldn't be historic uh, Yes, exactly. exactly. We want history to be properly, yeah. uh, you know, re- registered and not to have their their, you know, fantasies go down as history. Yeah, that's, that, I think that's important that we have, we've documented the things that I've documented in my books and you've documented in your book. And uh, yeah, exactly, it's, it's history. And we'll, mm-hmm. leave it, we'll leave it behind for others to see when we're go. gone. But hopefully, the, the, hopefully there'll be others that will pick up the torch and uh, do what we're doing. That's my prayer is I, I'm, I want to see more people yeah. doing this type of ministry and uh these people they need to be embarrassed they need to someone needs to draw attention to, to even for their own good because sometimes you have a blind spot and you can't see things and so uh some of them will repent people I would hope well yeah we we would hope i don't know what's going to happen some of them are too far gone but I was yeah, in word of faith. Point, I got out of it. So, but at what point does God give them over to their delusion? Some, uh, he's apparently he does. We we're seeing it. Yeah, yeah we're seeing it, especially with this whole Trump Cyrus thing and the and he's God's anointed and that kind of thing. But and and yet he does the things he does, which. No, I mean God's not going to bless somebody kneeling before somebody's blood and and praising somebody that calls himself God. He's not. He's not going to bless it. <laughs> no, no, he can't. No, it, it's just going to play into the end times delusions. Yeah. That's all. Either yeah. way, that's what's happening. It's playing into the end time delusions. So it's it's going to be interesting. The politics. I'm going to stay out of it because I don't see any hope. As far as I see the handwritings on the wall already about what's going to happen. And the most important thing is to get people saved and to get them on their way to heaven. There you go. Yeah. And so that's what I want to focus on anyway, is telling people the good news. So everybody can do something. If one person, if each Christian led one person to the Lord in a year, that would be a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you got to pray for opportunities. You know, though we're supposed to be preaching in season and out of season, but boy, are we out of season. <laughs> yeah. It, it, they, they're not listening. It's out of season. Well, there's there's some people that yeah. listen. I believe yeah. there's some people. It's a, there's there, a small. There. Yeah, there's yeah. a small remnant, but there are. Here. There are people that listen, and then when you when you realize that you have that opportunity where somebody is listening, then you can lead them. And just like people led us to the Lord, they shared the gospel with us, and eventually we got we understood it, and then we accepted, and we're born again, accepted Jesus, and we're born again, and He changed our lives. So we hope we hope that, but we want to warn we. Paul said, I cease not to warn you with tears. And so that's the way we feel, is that it's something we have to do, is to warn people and to tell people the the truth about who people are, what they really believe, and not to just accept anything. Yeah. Well, I wish someone would have shared the gospel with me, but I... I was saved reading the Bible, but I did hear the message. There was two men, and they were they're imperfect men, and they're still alive. That that I did watch on TV that that you know gave me the or showed me you know what you needed to do to be saved, and that was Jimmy Swaggart and Pat Robertson. Yeah. Okay, so God will even use faulty vessels. Oh, he did. He, yeah, he did. He did. He did. It's true. God even uses faulty vessels. People still get saved, even though uh, these people are messed up. These people yeah. still get saved. So because the word does not go out void. It, no, it doesn't, and that's that's the truth. 
That's the truth. So <laughs> if God used a donkey, right? That's right. And he said he uses the foolishness of preaching. <laughs> yeah. Well, praise the Lord. Yeah, it's amazing. He lets us do anything for him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jackie, that great show today. Thank you for coming on. So how can people reach you if they want to? Well, send me and uh, friend requests on Facebook. I track the the birth pangs as they happen, and as a lot of people are doing, I just uh, I think it's a good way to talk about those things. It's not a news source, but it's a place that we can talk about that with like minded people. Yeah. And uh, I also have a newsletter I put out uh, the first of every month, and you can sign up for that at my webpage, which is christiansentinel.com. Or you could, you know, Google me and find Christian Sentinel link. And then there's a form you can sign in and just give me your email address and you'll get the newsletter once a month. And it's something that I don't post to my page, nor do I share it on Facebook. So it's, uh, you know, my thoughts for the month and and reflections on, you know, what things we covered over the past month as far as the, the birth bangs go. And they're getting closer and more extreme as we get closer to his coming. The We're definitely... In the, you know, in, in heavy labor. Yeah, we're in heavy labor. So, uh, Elsa, you have your book, The United States of Israel, that's available on Amazon. Yes, and my book, The Fleecing of Christianity, you can read it free on PDF at my webpage, too. It's kind of dated, but yet it's still important. It's still relevant, yeah. It's relevant, yes. Yeah. And it's endorsed by uh, Jan and Paul Jan and Paul Crouch's granddaughter, <laughs> which, yeah, that's a whole other story. Yeah, well, we'll get into that another time. Yeah. All right. Okay. So God bless you, and uh, thank you for coming on. Good to be with you. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. All right, everybody, that's our program mm-hmm. for today, and we will... Be back next week with another program. But it, the most important thing is, is do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? The Bible says in the third chapter of John that you must be born again. First, you're born of your mother. Then you must be born again of the Spirit of God. And you say, well, how does that happen? You ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and to change your life and repent of your sins believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he said he's coming again, and he is. So no matter what's going on in the world today, Jesus has good news for you, and he'll give you a brand new life, and he'll give you peace and joy, things that you can't buy and things that you can't get without knowing the Prince of Peace. So give your life to Jesus today. He will never leave you or forsake you. God bless you.
peace.